Good morning. Once there was a stone age, a bronze age, and now we are in the middle of a plastic age. Because every year we produce about 300 million tons of plastic, and a fraction of that enters rivers, waterways, and eventually the oceans. If we want to eat a biscuit nowadays, we have to buy a biscuit within a plastic wrapper, within a plastic tray, within a cardboard box, within some plastic foil, within a plastic bag. It's not hazardous nuclear waste, it's a biscuit. And um, well, this is me. I love diving. Just taking you uh, through my holiday slides here. This is at the pristine Azores Islands. And this is how their beaches look. Covered with plastic fragments. Due to sun and waves, over the years the garbage breaks down into ever smaller pieces, but remains plastic. And, um, well, interestingly, you don't see a lot of wet particles in here, because those look like food to birds more than any other. So this is the result. And um, while uh, the, the debris primarily collects at these five rotating currents, called the giants, where it doesn't only directly kill sea life, but due to the absorption of PCBs and DDTs, also poisons the food chain. A food chain that includes us, humans. And while diving in Greece, I came across more plastic bags than fish. <laughs> and astounded by the, the depressing sights, my Scottish dive buddy turned to me and said, Well, lots of jellyfish here, dude. Seen about a thousand. <laughs> there were no jellyfish. And when talking about environmental issues in general, I, I think a common response is, well, that's a long way off, that's for our children to worry about. So, hello, here I am. <laughs> why don't we just clean it up? And there are multiple reasons why current plastic pollution researchers believe we should focus on prevention, for example, through education, rather than attempting a clean-up operation, because we would need to deal with five colossal areas, each moving around. Plastic sizes ranging from these massive ghost nets to molecules, <coughs> bycatches and emissions. Furthermore, we would need to get all the plastic back to land. It would need to be financially realistic and is in fact the total amount of plastic within the gyres unknown. But about a year ago, when I was on my way to the hairdressers, <laughs> I must admit, I don't go there often, but uh, I had this little epiphany. I saw even old people throwing rubbish in the water, and I thought, well, some people will just never learn, will they? We'll need a combination of both worlds, and we'll need them soon. So then, I simply used this list of concerns as challenges, and in fact, a week later, as a school assignment, I had the chance to spend a lot of time on a subject of choice, together with a friend of mine. And this gave me the perfect opportunity to do new and fundamental research regarding plastic pollution. I then went on holiday to Greece, taking this mantatrol with me, which is the common device for sampling plastic, and so I had to leave home all my clothes due to low-cost airline weight limit policies. <laughs> Well, uh, the troll we built, however, is 15 times finer than a regular one. And what we discovered was that the count of those minute particles is in fact 40 times higher than, a, than the larger particles. So we have to take these small plastics out. But then we wouldn't want to take the important plankton out as well. And luckily, these could simply be separated using centrifugal forces. However, nobody knew how much G-forces, common zooplankton, could survive. So, we took the troll out again. <coughs> oh, we did it on a boat, so... <laughs> and uh, we tested it. And in fact, they can survive over 50 Gs, which is more than enough for successful separation. And then, in order to know up to which 
which depth the ocean surface should be cleaned, we designed and built something that I call a multi-level trawl. We basically stuck 10 trawls on top of each other. And uh, here you can see us testing that on the North Sea. I saw it was a great day. I was the only one who didn't get sick. Yeah? But then the perfectly <laughs> working trawl yeah, we broke. So. And uh, of course, we didn't quit there. Because I believe you can't clean up something you don't know the size of. I've heard estimations ranging from several hundred thousand tons all the way to a hundred million tons. But I knew we really needed a better estimate, some, some scientific data. So then I simply contacted some professors from the universities Delft, Utrecht and Hawaii who then actually helped us with determining how much plastic there is in the top layers of the giants. The result? A whopping 7.25 million tons of extractable plastic in 2020. That's the weight of a thousand Eiffel Towers floating in the giants. Now, researcher and in fact discoverer of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, Charles Moore, estimates it would take 79,000 years to remediate that. However, I believe the Great Pacific Garbage Patch can completely clean itself in just five years. And that is a difference of 78,995 years. <laughs> conventional idea of extracting litter, right? So, you have a vessel and a net fishing for plastic. Of course, multiple vessels could be used to cover a larger area, but by spanning booms between those vessels, suddenly a much larger area would be covered, because the essence is not to catch the debris, but divert it. Because there is no mesh size, we can even get out the smallest particles. And since all organisms can simply move under the books, we'll be able to eliminate bycatches by 99.98%. But if we want to do something different, shouldn't we also have to think differently? For example then, the absorption of PCBs by plastic is not such a bad thing. It's a good thing. Get all the plastics out and simultaneously remove tons and tons of persistent organic pollutants from the marine environment. But how would we minimize environmental, financial and transportation costs then? Let's use our enemy to our advantage, okay? The oceanic currents moving around is not an obstacle. It's a solution. Why? Move through the oceans, if the oceans can move through you. By fixing the ships to the seabed and letting the rotating currents do their work, vast amounts of funds, manpower and emissions will be saved. <coughs> the platforms will of course be completely self-supported, receiving their energy from the sun, currents and waves. And inspired by my diving at the Azores, it now actually seems that the best shape for all these platforms is that of a manta ray. By letting its wings sway like a real manta, we can ensure contact of the inlet with the surface, even in the roughest weather. Well, imagine a zigzag array of just 24 of these platforms cleaning an entire ocean. Let's make a comparison, okay? These are the beaches of Hong Kong earlier this year. The largest plastic spill in history. And this is their source. Just six containers. How much could we get out? Over 55 of these containers per day. Um, not only is plastic directly responsible for over a billion US dollars in vessel damages a year, no, the awesome surprise for me was 
that if we'd sell the plastics retrieved from the five giants, we'd make over 500 million US dollars. And this is in fact more than the plan would cost to execute. In other words, it's profitable. But I believe that the key thing is that only if we realize change is more important than money, money will come. And yes, it will be one of the largest environmental rescue operations yet. But we created this mess. Heck, we, we even invented this new material first before we made this mess. So please, don't tell me we can't clean this up together. Thank you very much.